very uh, promising and interesting uh, platform as a service uh, cloud. So, before any further ado, it's all yours. Take it away. Um, for really beginning, how many of you have uh, how many of you have already used Heroku? Okay. How many of you have at least heard of this? Okay, cool. Um, so uh, so uh, I'm Craig Kirstein. Uh, this is uh, Kenneth Wright. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter if you wish. Um, so Heroku, you mentioned, is a platform as a service. Um, so there's probably a question of, of what does that mean? Because there's kind of everything as a service these days. It's the hot thing is to build a service. So there's software as a service, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and, and they're all kind of different things for different people. So uh, first with uh, software as a service. Um, software as a service is, is really meant for, for consumers, for users. You, it's personal accounting software, right? It, it's kind of anything on the web for users. Project management software. Yeah, you take your pick. Um, infrastructure as a service. So this is really for ops guys. How many people here do ops? How many people here are developers? OK, cool. That's what I like to see normally on a Heroku talk. We actually um, we love our ops people, but generally I prefer to develop an application and build features instead of keeping machines running. Uh, I appreciate the guys that do, but to me it's more interesting to build functionality. You're a developer, not a plumber. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so that's where uh, PASS comes in. So uh, it's platform as a service, and the idea is you don't have to think about servers, you don't have to think about managing logs, you don't have to think about load balancers. You just push code and it works. It, it sounds a little um, too nice, too good to be true, um, but it, for us, at least, we, we believe in it and it works. And at the end of the day, you're building features instead of shipping code. Um, so I'm actually going to dive in and show a really quick uh, demo on Python. Uh, what languages do people develop in here? Uh, who's in Ruby? Who's in Python? Who's in Java? Oh, wow, OK. Um, is there anything else that someone works very heavily in? JavaScript. Hmm? No JS. No JS. Okay. Um, so yeah, we support all of those. Um, we support all of those that are up there. Am I missing anything? Um, Ruby, Python, Java, Scala, Clojure, No JS, Logo. Secretly PHP. Sort of PHP <laughs> though. So that's, that's another thought. Um, go sort of um, just about any language you want. Aside from .NET, you can run on this pretty quickly. So I'm going to just hop over here to a very basic application that I was just uh, setting up. So what I've got is just a really basic application. Uh, this is a, a to-do application. Uh, there's nothing special about it. It can be any sort of web application. It, it's just an app. So I can uh, create demo, deploy demo, uh, mark something as completed. There's, there's nothing special there. Uh, so I'm going to stop it from running locally. And I'm actually going to go ahead and push this up to Heroku now. So, Heroku create Cedar. So this is our Cedar stack. This is our stack that supports all the different languages. What this is going to do is just give me a, a stub application. So I can go ahead and, and now grab this URL. And there's an application there, but it's not doing anything. So uh, for Python, we require just a couple things. Um, the first is a requirements.txt. Uh, for Ruby, we require a gem file. For Java, a pom.xml for Maven dependencies. It's whatever is the canonical form for that language. Node.js would do package.json. Um, so from here, because I have that requirements.txt, I'm going to go ahead and now just get push Heroku master. So when I created that application, it automatically created a Git remote for me. How many people here use Git? Sweet. <laughs> um, 
If you don't, you should. Um, <laughs> and if you don't, um, you can still deploy to us. It's just Git is our deploy mechanism. So when you're developing these applications locally, usually with Python, you'll set up a virtual env to isolate all of your dependencies, and they'll be using pip to install them. And when you push them up to Heroku, it does the exact same thing. Keeps it nice and simple. So right now, it's downloading all the dependencies that were in requirements.txt. It'll install it one time. So right here, it's to compiling PsychoPG, which has some C extensions. So it takes a couple seconds. But then once it's built, you don't have to do that again. And it's available. So what happens actually when we push to Heroku? It takes all those, builds them, compiles them into what we call a slug. And so more or less, this is a compressed version of your application that then we throw up into S3 and can download so that when you want to horizontally scale, it's not quite instant. It takes maybe five seconds to start running new processes. So that's kind of uh, the process. Yeah, so the compiled version here, like essentially is a tarball type of a thing of your application with the Python interpreter and everything. And so, so we can go back over here now that our deploy is finished. Reload this. And we're going to get an error because we got to create our database. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before. I'm just going to say Heroku run. And it's going to run this exact same man command up on Heroku. And Heroku's already got my database configured. Um, it has my application code. It knows how to run this command, just like I would local. Mm -hmm. You did that, sir. Did I? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to run the correct command. <laughs> and then I'm going to come back over here. I have this application. And anyone can connect to this. It's now live. I can now give Kenneth some tasks. And then he can share and collaborate and do them. So, oh, is this going to work? So essentially, what are we doing there? We're, we're running the process you're telling us to. There's, there's not much more magic to it than that. Um, the magic comes in when we actually keep it running, when things go down and, and things break and, um, you know, stuff happens. Um, so for us, the big thing is we don't want to do a lot of magic for you. Um, for some communities, they want a little more magic, some want a little less. Uh, for us, with Python locally, it's uh, create your virtual and install your dependencies. Um, with Java, it's Maven package. Um, Ruby is bundle exec, and, and you're good. Um, on Heroku, well, it looks really similar. It's the same thing. Um, so running it locally. So one thing I hadn't shown yet was this tiny little file called proc file. Um, and this is the only thing really unique to Heroku right now um, in all of this so far. And what we're saying is this is a web process, so within Heroku you can define multiple process types. And this is how we run that process type. So it looks very similar lo locally, except I'm going to bind to this port variable. So every web process is going to have a port it can bind to, and that's what it's going to listen for traffic on. In this proc file you have multiple entries, and it's essentially every entry point to your application. And then each of those points are individual processes that are isolated from each other. You, can, you have different knobs to control them. Individually, which we'll get into in a bit. So locally, it looks like that. On Heroku, there's one file that looks like that. So um, when we deployed, right now we're actually running a dyno, um, and that's a word we actually came up with. But the, it's a common question: What is a dyno? What do you do with a dyno? What is it? Uh, is it a server? Not really. But, um, then people think, okay, it's a, it's a virtual machine. How many people here are using virtual means, machines of some kind uh, in their deployment process? So it's sort of like that, but at the same time, it's not really. Um, for us, within a virtual machine, a lot of times you're running a lot of things, a lot of processes. For us, a dyno is just a process. That's all it is. You define the process, and you can have multiple processes and other processes if you wish. It makes it a little harder for you to manage, but you can do that. Um, so essentially that's what it is. 
It's um, like a virtual machine, except for it's completely isolated to your one application and the one actual process that's in your proc file. So every instance, like this, for example, this web process we have here, it has 512 megs of RAM, and it, it has it's essentially like a full oper operating system that it can alter, but they're all isolated from each other and abstracted. So there's no server to SSH into. We take care of all that stuff for you. So within a dyno, we can have multiple process types. So uh, again, a Python example with Celery's background jobs. This could be a delayed job for Ruby. And I'm actually unsure of the job will work. But, uh, but it's the same idea. You have things running, you know, accepting web processes, a background queue, doing background work. Um, any kind of process you want to name. And then you can scale those individually. So the idea is that you can scale any processes any way, which makes your application typically more horizontally scalable. So every one of these items here is actually a separate dyno, which is essentially similar to having a separate machine running a copy of the code. So within Heroku, I can actually look and see, just like I would in Linux, uh, what are my processes that are running? So we can see this one web process has been up for four minutes. Um, because we've Pushed it already, we've got a slug, we've got our application. Um, so we're, we got Hacker News, and now we have thousands of people using our application, and we need to have more instances of it running. Usually, when you were setting up an infrastructure, if you're doing this all manually, like on EC2, it would take almost like a year of a really talented engineer building all this infrastructure to automate this. But on Heroku, on Heroku was a little bit of latency. So I can scale it up to 100 processes, and you can see most of these have been up for yeah, a varying amount of time. And each of these is, is a separate dyno, which is essentially kind of like a 512 megabyte server that's hosting it, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> um, and we can actually see that uh, our logs here. So we can just tell our logs. So Heroku treats logs as streams instead of files. So usually if you had this whole infrastructure set up, you'd have to go in and either use a log management tool or go look at all these different servers and try to figure out everything that's going across all of them. And usually it's a very reactionary type of thing, like when something goes wrong, you have to go look and it takes all this effort. So Heroku makes it treats them as streams, which I'll come at this point. So if you hit the live site, Craig, it'll all these requests will be coming in. It'll be coming through automatically. So we can we see we serve, we serve something from Web 81. Uh, if we come back in, it's from Web 40. We're automatically load balanced between all the processes. So instead of having to, like I said, SSH into 50 different Nginx machines, look at this access log and that one, and then your database log, it's all aggregated into one place. And if you give it the P flag, you can isolate it so you can see only um, yeah, although I'm going to scale it down, yeah, otherwise I will never find it between the 100. <laughs> uh, so just scale it down to, to 10 processes. If um, you have a bunch of different processes to find, you can just see the, the logs for one process type or a particular instance if you want. And if you have a database, it'll inject, it'll, it'll tell you all the queries that are being run. So we can just uh, now look at web process number 5 if we want to only see it for some reason. And we got some stuff there but not that time. Well, wow. <laughs> Now we have this is true that the load balancer works. Yes, so there we go. <laughs> finally, finally it gets it. <laughs> So similar to that, uh, the idea that you can run anything. Uh, this is a Python example. Uh, we could just run raw Python, we could run Ruby. Heroku run Ruby. And this is actually going to connect to a completely isolated instance of our application. It's, it's up in the cloud, it's going to be slow because of latency right now. But this is a completely isolated copy of our app. So we can go in and actually just like remove all the files this instance can see, and as soon as he closes the session, like, it's no different than as if he was a, uh, yeah, it's just gone. It doesn't affect any other running instances.
and blame the Wi-Fi. Any questions so far? You guys are ready to <laughs> Yeah, if we go back to the isolation. Yep. I mean, it's probably a stupid question. But what degree of also isolation do you have between these machines? Like, could you open a port on the on the same port number? No. Or so it's more like uh, different processes running on the same physical machine. Yeah. So we're using LFC containers. Which are they completely isolate? They're more like a it's kind of like a cheap virtual machine, so it doesn't use as many resources, and we lock it down so you can only buy. Them. So when you so in this case, I just uh, yeah. did Heroku run Bash and I code port. Um, so this is my port for this application. So I can bind something to this, but no, nothing else. Um, nothing else will receive traffic. And if you try to bind to another port, it won't let you. Um, and now we can actually see our applications. I'm up on Heroku. Uh, and I can actually remove everything in the web application and still responding to requests and everything. It is really useful because you can go in and actually like make changes to your code and like try installing a different dependency and see you know see if it affects the code base before actually doing it on your website. So I can exit it and I can come back in. And it's still there as well. Are there going to be other C containers? Like from a security perspective, you would need, need a firewall or something to either the containers up again? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there are ops being out of all stuff. <laughs> it's quite, they're quite isolated. There's no way to uh, interact with any other process, yeah. even your own. So, pretty much, essentially, what you have to do is you know, if you use like a work computer database to communicate between the processes, they can't communicate directly. Awesome. Unless they're doing it over HTTP. Um, so that's great, Colin. You can run some code. Um, but for a web developer, usually the code is part of it. There's a lot that goes along with it. Um, so for that, we have uh, something we call add-ons. It's more or less kind of like an app store for developers. Um, so if you need Memcache, um, there's two different providers for it. Uh, if you need Redis, it's available. Mongo is available. Uh, if you need to send email. Uh, setting up a postfix server, maybe I'm the only one, but it's not a lot of fun usually. Um, <laughs> to send email, it shouldn't be quite so hard. Uh, so essentially, it should be easy. Um, logging Sentry in the, the Python world. Um, New Relic is great for app performance. Basically, take your pick. Um, and all actually, of these different services are treated as attachable resources, so they're not like running on the same box or anything. They're all you get environment variables that configure applications, so you can tell it where to point to these services. Um, so whether it's uh, logging, email, SSL, reporting, um, we actually run the the Postgres servers service as well, um, and do some extra stuff there. But uh, yes. So if you're running so, a, a, a service that's hosted, you can actually become an application provider and be available in like the Heroku app store, essentially, for your developers to use. And all the billing is unified through our system. You okay. Let's see you guy. You got thirteen percent. Any more questions so far? Seem a little too magical. That seemed pretty good. <laughs> I have a question about these adults. Uh, they're running an, an extra instance, like so you showed with the app server? So essentially, they are completely external to the platform in general. Some of them are run by us, some of them are run by other providers. They could be anywhere. We encourage them to be in the data center that we're in, which is a Amazon US East. So if I fire up like a memcache add-on, then it's not really an instance I get, but like a memcache server somewhere else that exactly. I'm using. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And it comes through as usually a, a URL. You'll get like redis colon slash slash and the configuration information, and then you connect to that. So in this case, if we were to add all these add-ons, um, what you would have is all of these environment variables. Um, so for us, this is kind of one more thing where we 
we gradually push you down that building scalable applications. Uh, if you start hard coding some of these things, then you have different environments. And who's pushed development or debug code to production before? Hey, come on. <laughs> yeah. it, uh, it, it's bound to happen when you're running different configs. Um, the problem is you should be able to run this exact same code in development and in production. The only difference is the, the backing services, really. So it's those things of, what is the email service I'm using? What is my database? Uh, what is my memcache? So for us, we actually use environment variables. So in this case, we can do Heroku add-ons, add uh, memcache. So some of their application providers will actually, like FPO, which is now defunct unfortunately, but what they would do is, if, is when you had a, an attachable resource that you wanted to connect to, they had a like a Python module that you import that would give all these definitions in, and that works really well if you're doing one language, but if you're supporting any language, you don't want to make any assumptions like that. So if you do them through environment variables, it works uh, really cleanly. A lot of other systems like Jenkins, a lot of continuous integration systems work this way. So it's very Unix oriented, nothing to lock you into the system. So if you run and take your code and take it off of Heroku and move it onto your own servers, you can just use the same mechanism. Um, so now we have actually memcache available to us. And we can connect to it, put stuff in it, take stuff out of it. And it took, it actually took about 10 to 15 seconds for us to have memcache available to us. And it's managed, so you don't have to worry about actually, you know, maintaining the server, doing backups, they take care of all that stuff for you. How does any work for that one? It's a, it goes to the same system that your Heroku code goes to. Okay. So everything's a completely integrated system. Um, the Usually, goal is actually to make developers' lives easier and more productive. Um, so one less bill, one less place to do something, um, typically means a little bit more pro productivity. Is it, is it like a known process, Dino, or is it separate? Do you pay for it, or is it included in the Dino? Uh, it's separate. So each one has their own pricing. Okay. Um, so it all depends, um, in this case, uh, Memcache. Uh, you can see they have a free one that's a, a small 5 megabyte, 100 megabytes for 20 a month, um, and contact them for the larger ones. And it really depends. Uh, most have a, a free tier, so here's another Memcache one. Uh, that has 25 megs for free. And we prorate this by the second. So if you spin up you know, a really big one just for a little bit, you can go back down and only charge for the time that you used it. Speaking of such, I'm going to scale it down. <laughs> you said the default version is uh, uh, Amazon USB? Yes. Okay. So can you, can you deploy it in, in uh, EU West? Um, like here in Europe, you have to deploy it in the EU West region. Yeah. Like the the region. yeah. Um, so it, I would say, um, let's, let's come back to that. Um, <laughs> it's, we already heard that a good bit this week, so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all of so, our work currently runs in USDs. Okay. All right, so some more demos. Uh, for some resources, you can check out um, our Dev Center, which has uh, just about any quick start you want. So whether it's Java, Node.js, you can pick your language and go through there. But a few more kind of features and things, and then we can have some more questions. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and make a change. And I'm going to go ahead and break my application and not test it. <laughs> I'm sure none of us have done this either. Push code live to production? Oh, you have a live on the server. That's so weird. <laughs> so I'm going to push this. So this is just going to break my application. It's not going to know how to start.
and then I get a fun error page. Um, so not that you should ever push untested code to production, but if you do, um, because we build everything into a slug, we take all of those environment variables, everything. Um, fixing this is actually as simple as Heroku rollback, and we can roll back to any point in time, really. So now I can come back to my application, and it's running the old version of my code. No, this is fine if you really just depend on your code, but let's say you have a Ruby project and use Active Record uh, for persistence where you also have a data migration that might run along with it. Yep. Does rollback also do a rollback on migration? It doesn't automatically. Um, your, your database is considered a completely external resource from your application code. So in that case, um, it's not going to automatically roll back. We can talk offline because um, we're looking into actually some, some ability for like point in time recovery to roll back your data at any point in time from some period ago. Um, is it possible to have sort of a development and production branch? So you're sort of contested in public with your production database um, and then push it once it's, it's good? Yeah, so I mean, in that case, um, if we want to actually see what our git config looks like, um, you can see I've got where I checked it out from origin. I've got master. Um, or excuse me, I've got Heroku. Um, our very, very common setup is to have just a new Heroku app. Because all it is is an application. And then we push to staging, we push to production, and we push to dev. Um, and the difference then is the database, right? Um, that way you can easily test your code at any point in time and can be able to deploy it at time as well. So usually you do git push produ or, you know, production master or staging master. So I can go ahead and Heroku create. But that also means you have to pay one dyno more. So we and get one free dyno per month per app. Okay. Yeah. They can run, you have 750 free hours, so, okay. which is at the moment. So. It's pretty nice because that means that you can run pretty much any web application on us for free as long as you're, you know, if it runs in a single process. And then, you know, we actually start charging you when you start to scale. Actually, really get the benefits right now. What, what is the definition of an app? That's a good question. Pretty much just the, the repository <coughs> that you can push up with a prompt file. So if you, you just define these entry points in your application, that is your application. So if, let's say, your real app, your, your, from an app side point of view, app consists of 20 backend services, each of them can be your own app. Yes, those are all separate apps. So in this case, uh, yeah, some other providers like .cloud will kind of cluster those into a single app and we keep them all separate. So pretty much a service is essentially that. So now just by adding a new Heroku app, calling it my Git Remote Production, I can push to production or, or to my other Heroku one, which could be staging. Um, and it's a very common model that we use pretty heavily internally. And we only listen to the master branch on the remote, so if you want to push up a, like a development branch to production, you do get push. Staging, you know, um, develop colon master, and it'll push up the develop branch as master. And we do that so that you can push up all your other branches and, you know, not have them in production, obviously. And then we've got another app that's now broken because of our database, but should be up. Oh, oh did I? Well, I, it's because I pushed the new code. That's committed. So, um, so you get the general idea. How do you treat uh, Git sub-modules? Sub we you... check them out automatically. Okay, cool. If it has access to them. So you and, usually and, have to be open. So. And in reverse or uh, just at uh, the baseline? Um, I think, I don't know if we, you mean like actually traversing them? If yeah, they have, yeah. I'm not sure. I am unsure as well. I, I would be, actually, I think it does traverse, because you know, some of our internal apps do that. So yes, it does traverse them. Um, that's pretty much Heroku in the platform. Um, So it's, it 
it's a separate service that's exposed here. So it's kind of attached to that. No. Um, in this case, we're going to call that. So when you add, we, we automatically